thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we are recording this so that you'll have it to reference after tonight. But here's our plan. We want to talk about the process that is required for international students who want to intern in the United States. So for every student at Seton Hall, there is a process between the Career Center and their academic department. But for international students, there are some layers on top of that. And we want to make sure that you are you are understanding them and that you are following through on these because otherwise you may find yourself in a situation that you don't want to be in and we can't help you fix it because they're not our rules. They are government rules and we, we will be at a loss. So we're talking about three different areas and those are all represented on this call tonight. One of them is OIP, which I'm sure you know is the Office for International Programs. And Maria is on the call tonight. She's going to be talking a lot about the legalities, about the regulations, about your process to make sure that you're in compliance with that. Um, Dean Lawrence Ed is on the call with us to talk about the academic side of this and what you are going to need to do with your academic department, regardless of what your major is. Um, the individuals might change. Um, somebody is not muted. So whoever that is, could you please mute your mic? Thank you. Um, and the third is the Career Center, and Sarah Andrews is with us this evening to talk about that part. Um, we do have a few questions um, that students have submitted in advance, but we will open this up at the end. You can put any questions that you have in the chat, um, and we will try to get to everything before we all say goodnight. So um, first thing I want to say is that if you're a freshman, our recommendation is that you meet with someone in each of these areas this year. That is the best case scenario so that you have plenty of time to plan and meet the timelines that, that have been set up. If you are beyond that, it's not too late, but just don't wait too much longer. We want you to connect with us as soon as you can. Um, it's probably not a one-shot thing. It's probably not a one-time visit to your academic advisor or the career center or OIP, but at least the one time you will get to know somebody there and start to make your plan. So we're going to start with um, Maria, who is, well, you can introduce yourself, Maria. Um, you want to just tell everybody who you are? Sure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maria Buzas. I'm the director of the Office of International Programs. I know most of you on the call today, so I'm glad we're having this conversation because we do want to better inform students about the process and all the key offices that play a role in it. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. Okay, Maria, can you start with, we want to start with CPT. Can you explain what that is and who is eligible anyway? Sure. So CPT actually stands for Curricular Practical Training. And what it is is an off-campus training experience that fulfills a requirement in your academic program. So any F1 student in a degree program that's been maintaining their full-time status for one academic year would be eligible to begin the process. And the second piece of the eligibility is confirming with your academic advisor, or maybe you have an internship advisor in your program or field placement advisor, confirming that there's some kind of requirement in your program that this off-campus training can fulfill. And so, at what point in their um, college journey should they be applying for CPT? The best scenario, as you said, is to get started as soon as possible. It, ideally, students should begin exploring this opportunity in their first year. Students should be interacting with the key offices you mentioned. OIP will confirm those basic eligibility criteria that I mentioned that you've been studying for one academic year the Career Center for help with securing the internship, resume writing and all that stuff. And the academic advisor, as I said, maybe it's an internship advisor or clinical advisor to um, maybe they would help you find those clinical placements, but also they would um, confirm that you do have a requirement like that in your program. So applying as soon as possible is key. Students that do it in an opposite fashion and find the internship first and then begin the process run into trouble. 
Um, Maria, how do students schedule right now, given that we're quarantined and some students are home and hybrid? Um, what's the best way to, for somebody to reach you or schedule an appointment with you? Emailing the OIP, oip at shu.edu is the best way to request an appointment, or we are also offering drop-in advising sessions, which are quick 15-minute phone calls, and you can sign up for one of those either on our website or it's in our email signature. Okay, thanks. And um, where are the applications? If somebody wants to get started and then connect with you when they see what their questions are, how do they find that and what do they need to do about that? So to actually request the CPT authorization, the OIP has a CPT application on its website under forms for F1 students. And you can review the process overall as we've been explaining and also look at the checklist that's required to submit to our office. So that involves a student um, signing a form, the advisor signing a form. We need a letter from the employer, we'll call it. Um, proof of registration for a course if that pertains to you. And once you've submitted a complete application to our office, then we our normal processing time is five to seven business days. And they can send the application again via email or we also have a Dropbox linked in our email signature and website. So do I understand correctly that if a student starts to apply online, they start to go through this whole process and they get stuck? they can reach out to you and you'll help them through that process? Sure, okay. definitely. Okay, and is it free to apply for this? Yes, it's one of the few things that are free. <laughs> and we do the authorization in our office. It's not an application that's mailed out to USCIS. So that's good to know, unlike OPT it takes several months to get approved. So we're doing it in our office and there's no fee to apply. Okay, thank you. And I, my question was going to be how long it takes, but I think you said five to seven days. So does that mean that within a week or so they should be hearing back about their application? Yes, that's, that one, that's once we have a complete application. So okay. it, sometimes there is a bit of back and forth, and that's why we encourage students to start the process as soon as possible and review the application so that they're familiar with the requirements. Okay, thanks. So we're going to move on to the academic, but to the people on the call, we can we will come back to Maria with any questions that you have later on. So, um, so Dean Lorenzette, who I think is now on the screen, um, can you talk about the academic side? So we said that there is a piece that the students, let's say I I have already applied or I have spoken with Maria's office about it. Um, and they told me I have to speak to an academic advisor. Wh what is that? Who is that? What do I need to get from that? Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll just try to reinforce uh, the things Maria said, and because I, they I, they were all well said and uh, conform with our approach. And so when a student gets that message, oh, meet with your academic advisor at the. At, I'll start at the graduate level, but then we can speak undergrad also, of course, at at the graduate level. That simply means the program director. So, for example, uh, on the call right now is uh, Professor Crevice, and uh, Professor Crevice is the program director for the master's in accounting programs. So, if it was a graduate student in accounting and they were pursuing uh, curricula CPT, curricular practical training, and they had uh, followed the procedures that were just uh, laid out uh, by Maria, then part of that would include getting sign off from Professor Crevice that there is, in fact, a, a location for this course in this student's curriculum that this experience, this four credit experience is going to count toward the degree program requirements. Uh, if it was the MBA program, they would come to me. Uh, and if it was undergraduate, uh, we have had students go to their academic advisors in many cases. So who, if they're a finance concentration, they could go see their uh, advisor. But I will also add on that that we have also been very willing in the dean's office that the undergraduate students have come to my office in many cases and while i'll interact with the advisor to make sure that we're both on the same page i have been uh, happy to sign off uh, for undergraduate students thank you so dean lawrence ed is in stillman school but the other deans in the other schools and colleges are 
happy to do the same thing and help you with through this process. So yeah, I'm um, sorry, Risa, if I can, you just uh, raised yeah. a good point there. I, I apologize to not make it too Stillman specific. The exact model would apply in the other schools just the same way. They right. would either go to their program director or and or their dean's office and, and would would meet with the same results. Thank you. So um, uh, Maria mentioned that this has to meet some requirement of the program. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, regardless of the school or college, uh, the uh, for CPT, uh, the experience can't really just simply be, I want to take the experience. Uh, the experience, I mean, it, by definition, the, the title itself, curricular practical training, there's an implication there that it's, it's a piece of the curriculum for the student. And so the student has to uh, have a logical location for this course in their curriculum. One of the things Maria said that I want to reinforce there is uh, the importance of acting early and planning here. Because now there may simply be a program that has a required practical experience in it. Those exist within the business school and those exist in other parts of the university and schools and colleges as well. It may be the case that, OK, you don't have a specific requirement that says you must take a, an internship, for example, in order to graduate this program. However, you may have electives and options uh, within that program. Almost every single degree program we have here at Seton Hall has that. And so if you're not well thought out in advance and you eat up courses that could have been used for CPT, that's the, as Maria sort of said, that's the location where students find themselves in trouble. That's exactly the spot where they would find themselves in trouble. So the real issue here is knowing you're having your intent to uh, to engage in CPT, to plan that out in advance with your academic advisor so that it's clear that, OK, this is the spot in the curriculum that's going to be used for CPT. And does it matter? Is it an intern course? Is it an independent study? Is it like what are the courses that would they would potentially take to meet this requirement? Sure. Uh, it, in most cases, and what, what we consider most desirable really is that it be an internship course. Uh, we are aware of and, and have had cases where the student has been able to use it as an independent study. They do the work, they complete the work experience, and then they have a complimentary project or set of projects with a faculty member and it goes under the independent study code. The most preferable and most straightforward is to have it go under an internship code where a similar thing would happen. They do the they complete the work experience and then they complete the academic components that the faculty member has assigned to them. Uh, but from our experiences, we have been successful doing both. OIP has been very helpful to us in that process. Our preference, and I, I don't want to speak for Maria, but I suspect OIP's preference as well, uh, is for it to go under an internship code, but some programs may not have that as readily available as others. Maria, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, as long as OIP sees that it will fulfill some kind of requirement of the program, you know, it would be acceptable. Like Dean Lorenze said, some programs may not have an internship course available to them, but I also was told the same thing, they should. So as long as you plan early enough and you still have general electives that you need to take, you can use the internship course to fulfill those requirements. But we have had students, maybe more on the graduate level, that have registered for directed research or an independent study and use that for their electives um, or maybe other requirements. And that those courses, since they're very general and are project specific, have one additional requirement, which is to submit a syllabus outlining how the experience is connected to the academic piece. Thank you. So Steve, one last question. Um, does it matter if the students do an internship in during the academic year or over the summer? Uh, no, it, it doesn't. And we've had we've certainly had cases of plenty cases of both. So fall, spring, summer, uh, there is uh, wide flexibility in it and uh, we're very flexible and I know the other dean's offices are and OIP is as well as it relates to when the student completes the internship. I just come back to the key requirement of you have to have a clear place in it that it's going toward the curriculum. But when you fulfill that fall, spring, summer, uh, there's there's great flexibility. Thank you. 
Before we move on to the Career Center, just one thing about um, tuition that you should just be aware of is that when you take a course uh, in the during the academic year, you are already covered for up to 18 credits for, through your comprehensive tuition. Um, when you take a course over the summer, you are paying tuition by credit. So it's just something to look into and, and check a little bit. So I'd like to move on to Sarah, um, who is the assistant director um, at the Career Center. And Sarah is going to talk a little bit about the process to actually find the internship, because you can do all these other things. But if you don't have an intern line, internship lined up, that's going to become another problem. So Sarah, how, do, how does a student go about preparing for this and applying for internships? Thanks, Risa. So I think the theme of, of this presentation is definitely planning ahead, as my colleagues said. And so at the Career Center, before you actually secure the internship, we really want to make sure that you are prepared. And so that means that you have your resume, that it has been reviewed, that you feel confident and comfortable in um, knowing who you are and your uh, contributions that you're going to be making to a potential internship or um, employer. And so we can help you with things like interviewing practice, networking, what, what all of those things entail, especially as an international student. And then when you do start to actually apply, we have a system called Navigator, which is our jobs and internships board online. And you can find that through PirateNet or our website. And that's a place where all employers who have opportunities, who ha we have relationships with and who we have vetted, uh, can go ahead and submit their opportunities for you to apply to. Um, you can certainly use that as your main resource. There are other opportunities, obviously, um, on LinkedIn um, and other um, trusted aggregators. Uh, you're welcome to search for those, but we really want to make sure that the opportunities you're applying to and that you do accept are um, they have been vetted and that they're not potential um, areas where it might not be accepted um, as an opportunity for you. So you can certainly use Navigator um, and we will work with you to make sure that those are great opportunities. Yeah, I was just gonna say the same way I was asking Maria, if somebody starts to look and has difficulty finding something can they contact you for help? Will, will you yeah. help them through that process? Definitely. Uh, you can certainly schedule an appointment through Compass um, to see myself uh, or if I'm not available, any of our advisors are available. You can also give us a call and we'd be happy to go through that process with you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just add that the Career Center has a generic email address so that since we are not in the office um, much these days, if you have a question, the best way to reach us, if you don't know your who your academic, um, I'm sorry, your career advisor is, email us at careers, that's plural, C-A-R-E-E-R-S, at shu.edu, and we'll be getting back to you to help you um, schedule something. So Sarah, what does it mean when an employer talks about sponsorship? So sometimes you might see on, especially in Navigator, uh, that you need to have a particular visa, F1, or that you are able to work in a particular location, such as the United States, with or without sponsorship. Sometimes an employer at a career fair or a networking event will mention sponsorship. So uh, it's really a good idea to first and for foremost not mislead the employer about your status. Um, you, you really don't want to try and trick the system or the employer that cannot end up um, with, with offers being rescinded. Um, you really want to have a conversation with that employer and ask them, um, do they mean for a particular visa that you might need after graduation, or are you referring to um, my CPT or OPT? If it is CPT, you can have a conversation with them and let them know 
that they don't need to hire lawyers for any of that. Um, you're not looking for sponsorship per se and, and really ask them what that means. And so if, if they are unsure, then perhaps you could speak with someone in HR or another colleague of theirs just to get that clarified because it is a conversation with all employers um, and with all employees who are recruiting for the employer. Um, sometimes they're actually unsure or they need clarification themselves. And if you need help with practicing how to talk to an employer, we're also here to assist you with that. And we can most certainly speak with the employers ourselves as well. Will you be having some specific workshops that are held just for international students over the next several months? Yes, we will. We're always looking forward to when we get to host particular international student interview workshops, networking, um, and they're very specific to particular issues that international students tend to face and how to overcome those. Thank you. Okay, one more question before we start getting to the student questions. Um, are there specific uh, websites that you would recommend that, that international students go to look for internship opportunities? So, um, of course, uh, Navigator, definitely. Um, and then there is a website called um, My Visa Jobs. That's a, a good resource for students to start. Um, also, if you look on places like LinkedIn or Google and you can really use them as aggregators and you can narrow the parameters of your search. You can sometimes um, get different results based on those particular uh, criteria that you do set. And we can help you look for those as well if you come in for an appointment. Thank you. Um, I'm going to look at the chat in a second, but um, also in addition to LinkedIn, uh, Seton Hall now has a site. I don't know if you're you're familiar with it. It's called Pirate Connect, and Pirate Connect is only filled, only populated with the Seton Hall community, and it works in a similar way to LinkedIn, except that it's only Seton Hall students and alumni and administrators at, at the university and faculty, so that you can you can search by any parameter you want, and if there's um, if there are alumni in the system who were themselves international students and have marked that in there, you, you can find them in there and it's a great networking resource. Um, so let me just take a look at the checks. I know there's a few questions here. Um, I think this is for Maria. <laughs> now I've got to go back and forth between these. Uh, what is the minimum duration of CPT? CPT is based on a curricular requirement, so it's a, it's approved on a semester basis. So especially if it's linked to a course, then we'll be approving it for the approximate dates of a semester or maybe it's a summer session. If there's programs like, let's say, MHA or nursing where they have to fulfill a certain number of hours, then we might um, approve it for dates, you know, outside of the semester because it's really based on hours, not a course. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, how much does it cost to register the internship course? So let me just be clear, I can answer that. And I don't want anybody to think that there is a fee for us putting you in an intern course or going through this whole process. If you are going to earn credit at Seton Hall or any other university, the only mechanism through which you can earn credit is to take a course. And the course involves, in this case, instead of actually attending class two or three times a week, you are going to the work site or virtually going to the work site right now, probably. Um, but in addition to that, you will meet with your faculty, whoever's teaching that course in the beginning of the semester, and you'll agree on whatever assignments you're going to have. Semester, so that at the end, you will be graded on your performance on the job, but also on the assignments that you've handed in and the way you've been evaluated and how the professor um, evaluates the learning that you've experienced during the semester. So for that, you will earn the three credits 
and therefore you will be charged tuition for those three credits, just like any other three credit course at the university. Um, during the academic year, like I said before, it's part of your comprehensive tuition as long as you don't go over 18 credits. Um, in the summer, it's per credit. Um, Dean Lawrence, said, is, is, is that accurate the way I just described that? It is. It is anything that falls, uh, basically anything that falls between 12 and 18 credits for the student is charged to comprehensive tuition. So as long as they stay under 18 uh, in terms of credit total, they're in good shape. Thank you. And if they go if they go over their charge per credit or if they go one credit over or whatever it is, they're charged for that. But uh, and I bring this back to uh, occasionally maybe there would be uh, a reason why even a well planned out student might find themselves paying an overload charge. But generally speaking, with uh, effective planning but on their own, as well as in collaboration with their academic advisor and and OIP, of course, um, and the career center for that matter. But really, it's just a function of have it planned out, understand where your credits are going to go each semester, and to the extent that you do that, the likelihood that you're going to stay under 18 credits in any given semester, fall or spring, and not pay overload is, is very high. You can avoid that. Thank you. Um, another question for Maria. Going back to the CPT length, is there a cap on the approved number of hours? I'm wondering because I want to do multiple internships and don't want to max out on total CPT hours. So again, CPT is based on your program requirements. If your program does have multiple requ um, requirements that you could fulfill through the CPT experience, then you can do multiple CPT opportunities. There is no cap, there's not a number, but it's always based on your program. So it, you shouldn't think of it as an ongoing work authorization because it's not designed for that. And from what I've seen, the programs at Seton Hall don't have requirements that are set up in that way for it to be ongoing. So I don't know if this is a question that you can answer as well. I'm a law student and I'm looking to do a summer internship for both my first and second years and would also like to do externships during the school year. Is that doable? So the law school is a little tricky and I actually do have um, a document that we outlined along with Dean Cascarano for law school students and as long as you have studied full time for one academic year you could be eligible for CPT but I think there are some restrictions with the law school like you cannot gain credit for um, for an experience or it's not really fulfilling a requirement of the program. So that's where it gets tricky. And that's where maybe OPT is a better fit because this, when it's just a great experience in your field of study, that's what OPT is for because that's optional practical training. Whereas CPT is curricular practical training and not every single student may be eligible for CPT. But we can talk more if you email OIP we can have an appointment. That's what I would suggest. Thank you. Um, somebody asked if we could repeat the name of the place. It's the LinkedIn with the Seton Hall alum. I just put it in the chat with the link to go in there. Um, students are pre-populated in that system you, so that when you go in, you'll you have to wait a minute till you're approved, but you will be approved if you're a current student. Um, same thing with alumni. So some people, if you're already in there, you'll get it right away. If not, you may have to wait a day or so. But but if there's a problem, you let us know. Um, I am a computer science major, would like to pursue an internship this summer with some brands. If I was to complete one, do I note it and put it in my resume as complete? Would I need to complete any particular documents to be eligible to work here since I'm from Kenya? So. I'm not sure if that's a question about getting the internship or um, for Maria, but the, I think the documents are what you spoke about before, Maria, correct? Well, I would comment that any off-campus training experience, whether it's paid or unpaid, does need to be authorized either through CPT or OPT. The only thing that doesn't need to be authorized in a, in a training sense is a volunteer opportunity that is strictly, truly volunteering, meaning humanitarian in nature. 
That's a good point because sometimes students think that if they have an unpaid internship, especially now that some um, employers are finding it difficult to, to come up with salaries for interns um, because of the situation we're in. But if it is a for-profit organization that's manufacturing widgets, that's not going to probably not going to. Um, and Sarah, would you like to answer the other part of this question about a computer science student who wants to pursue a summer internship? Um, what would you recommend that I, I just um, left the chat, so I don't remember if it was a he or she. You, my apologies for that. Yes. Yeah, so again, it, I'm not clear if you've already um, agreed to the internship or not. But um, you know, again, you want to make sure that you're in contact with uh, the office, with OIP, with uh, ourselves at the Career Center, and your academic advisor or the person who is. Um, looking to provide the course credit and the syllabus and everything. Um, and if you don't have it yet, then we would be most happy to help you acquire that. Um, we would really want to speak to you about what you're looking for, what kind of experiences, and then um, are the opportunities available uh, and seeing if you would be eligible for that uh, internship. And so um, really making sure to work with all three offices or departments and completing any forms uh, that are required in advance is key here. Thank you. Um, I just somebody put a question about OPT and my response was what was your question but now I see a thumbs up so I'm going to assume that Maria answered that question but if you have another one please put it in the chat. Um, I don't see any more questions so I think we'll give everybody just one another shot if um, if anybody else wants to add to this. Uh, wait a minute, there was another question. I to see someone's asking about CPT. Yeah, it, well, this one says to clarify, we only need to apply for CPT once, once we have a job lined up. Correct. Go for it, Maria. <laughs> Correct. But then if you are planning to do another CPT authorization, maybe it might be with the same employer for a different semester because you might be, let's say, registering for another internship class to fulfill another elective requirement, then you will have to apply again for CPT. Um, while you're on the screen, there's one other thing that I always need clarifying, so I have to assume at least one other person does. Um, there is some information you are going to need as part of this whole thing for, from your employer as well. Do you want to talk about that without too much detail so I don't get more confused? <laughs> so one of the items on the checklist is to send OIP a copy of your offer letter. And we have in the application packet what pieces of inf information we're looking for, such as a start date. So because we've had students kind of applying uh, last minute, we did recently indicate in the application that ideally a student should be submitting a complete OPT application with a start date two weeks out from the day you're submitting it so that we have processing time. We want to avoid a student sending us a offer letter last minute and then we need our, let's say, five to seven business days to process it. And now your offer letter has a date in the past. You know, students shouldn't be working off campus without any authorization. And we would want even your offer letter to match your CPT authorization so that there are no questions asked in the future. Thank you. And we have two questions that are similar, and that is, when should they start the process to apply for OPT? Should that happen before they graduate or after? So OPT, again, you can find more information about it on our website. Right under the CPT form is the OPT application. And um, that's very quickly, it's just 12 months of work experience in your field of study, and it is optional. So you could potentially split it up and do some of it during your program and some after. I'll tell you realistically, students that have been applying recently to do some of it during their program, 
it's taking long to approve. So we recommend to do it after. Most students do it after anyway. They like to do one year of full-time working and maybe transition hopefully into a work visa. Um, so the earliest you can apply for OPT is 90 days before your I-20 end date. Thank you. Um, again, I don't see any more questions, so let's just give it another minute and if not. Risa, I saw yes. that uh, Michelle had his hand up, uh, so he may have had something he wanted to. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead and unmute yourself so, and you can ask the question yourself because I don't see it. Okay. Uh, hi, um, my question is, uh, I have a master from California um, eight years ago, master in health administration. And now I'm almost done with my PhD in health science. Uh, if I want to apply for an opening job, every time I apply, they ask me, do you need a sponsorship in the future and to work in the U.S.? Uh, should uh, can I apply in this case for work visa or OBT? Um, well, after you, after each level, uh, so you're in your PhD program now. You're eligible for one year of OPT. So you don't need additional sponsorship for the year of OPT, but beyond that, you would. I see. Okay. So I know it's a little hard to kind of which box do you click if they're asking this type of question on paper. It's more of a conversation that needs to be had with the employer. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, again, in, in the interest of respecting everybody's time, um, I think I thank all of the panelists. This has been great. I think this has been very informative. A few people are asking about recording. Yes, we are recording it. It will be available um, as soon as we get it back on through the Career Center's website and through OIP. If you also want us, we can send you the link via email. Um, thank you all for participating. Again, if you want to reach um, the Career Center, it, the best way to schedule is through Compass. Um, if you have difficulty, careers at shu.edu. And Maria, can you want to just remind them how to find you? The best way is also through email, oip at shu.edu. Okay, great. And then as far as your academic, um, I'm sorry, as far as your academic advisors, you should know who that is. Um, if you don't, then you need to find that out and then you can reach them I, they should be also in Compass. Um, Steve, if, if students go to their Compass page, don't they see who their academic advisors are in case they don't know? Is, is yes, that right? That okay. is right. And, and if for any reason they had any, and ideally they've already been interacting with them, but on the off chance right. that there was some confusion and, and somehow some technical errors, which I, I think that both of those happening is unlikely, but let's just say that it did then I would recommend going to your dean's office and your dean's office could certainly say to you or communicating email, whatever, calling your dean's office. They could certainly say to you, OK, based on this program, this is who your program director is or this is who your academic advisor is. And, and, that, and that would that would just be a safety net. Thank you. I'm going to sure. stop recording now. So thank you, everybody, all the panelists for your time and your expertise tonight. I hope this has been helpful to all of our students.